Come in, I'm going to say hi to you as I see you. I want to share some things with you very briefly. Um, I have not been absent. Um, I've been working. Hey, Diamond, I love you. Hey, Branch JP, I see Kawana33. Uh, looks like it says a martini. How you doing? Good evening. Brad and Clack, Apostle Yolanda. Hey, Prophetess Keisha, I see you in here. Hello, Timotheus, I love you as well. Yes, last night last night was a, it was powerful. It was hundreds upon hundreds of people together um, for eight hours uh, seeking God. It was just intense. Um, hello, uh, holy girl for life. Uh, Marquita 20, yes, indeed, you're right. Uh, Corey B, yeah, I have been comatose all day, to be very honest with you. I have been out all day sleeping because we were up and I stayed to the, the last hour hanging out with our young adults. It was amazing. Hey, Prophetess Keisha, Pastor Josh, love you so much. I see Apostle Brenda, the Lord bless you. I see um, BT87, first time man from Cincinnati, uh, Natty, welcome. Prophet Ruckins McKinley, God bless you. Uh, hey, Vicky, good to see you. Recharge was amazing. All right, first of all, I want to thank all of you that were with us yesterday for um, our shut-in. It was absolutely phenomenal. One of the people uh, that was there from All Nations just said, uh, it was devastating. Hey, Prophet Danielle, my wife and I were just talking about you. Love you, sweetheart. And it was amazing, man. We uh, were together. The worship was intense. We sought the Lord together. I preached. Uh, Pastor Jamal preached. We ministered uh, uh, to quite a few people all night. It was so amazing. I am Telefero. So good to see you. Hey, Sarah. And uh, it was awesome. Ryan Booker, I told him he brought the full weight of everything he was in the room last night. It was amazing. So um, quite a few people periscoped it. If you want to go back on my periscope or my wife's periscope to watch it, uh, it would probably bless you. Hey, Hutch, miss you. So it was awesome. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, there were people who received deliverance yesterday. It was just amazing. And we had never done a shut-in uh, before for young adults. And so it was it was very powerful to experience, very powerful to witness. So thank you for all of you that uh, supported it and all of you that watched it. Um, those of you that have been following me know that I have been in a teaching entitled, Let Us Alone, The Cry of Demons. And I've been talking about our Christian obligation, our Christian responsibility to engage the powers of hell to set men free. The Bible says in Acts 10.38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth to do good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So part of doing good to those of us that believe is ministering to those that are under certain levels of oppression from the devil. And uh, I think that if we have a vision to do good, we must include deliverance in the vision. All right. So I'm going to share something with you uh, really quickly I'm, uh, in my word right now. But I want to give you my thoughts for tonight. Um, I want you to share this periscope with your followers. And uh, it's going to be a blessing. Thank you so much. All right. Um, my teachings on deliverance and spiritual warfare are available on YouTube on the Anwar video. They are all available for replay. And um, I am going to give you some thoughts. I'm, I'm continuing this series tomorrow morning at 7359 South Chappelle All Nations Worship Assembly. Uh, we have an 830 and we have an 1130. So I'll be continuing this uh, in the morning. And then next Sunday, I'm going to start separating the teaching. So generally speaking, when I'm in a series, I preach the same message in both services. As of next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching different messages in each service. So I'm going to be preaching on one thing in the 830 and another thing in the 1130. So you're either going to have to pay attention on live streaming, get the DVD, or be at both ones because I have a lot of information to get out. And so that's starting next week. All right. I am a, um, a, a deliverance minister, amongst other things, and um, I have been creating a template and a theological construct. Hey, John, John, I love you. I was just thinking about you before I periscope, uh, but I was um, thrown into the ministry of deliverance, 
and spiritual warfare um, actually probably before I started preaching. And, um, and so as such, I've had a lot of experiences with ministering to a lot of different people with a lot of different needs from a lot of different angles with a lot of different strategies for it. And um, I've been in a consistent, maybe three year long discussion about both. Okay. If you are paying attention, I want you to go ahead and I want you to write that word both. Go ahead. Just so that I know that you are with me and you are alert and you are engaged. Both. Both. Yes. Often when we pioneer a truth, we often preach the truth and the revelation that we have as if it is either or. Um, we have a tendency to gravitate towards a thing we have the most understanding of. But I believe that when you're dealing with deliverance, particularly when it comes to an individual, you do need both. And so this both that I am talking about is the marriage and the consolidation and the merger of deliverance and counsel. Deliverance and counsel. I don't believe that either are as effective as they should be exclusive one to the other. I believe that deliverance is a priority. I believe that deliverance is something that all believers need and probably in an ongoing fashion, depending upon who you are and what you're going through. But then I believe what helps you to maintain your right to deliverance and what uh, maintains your freedom in deliverance is the training that you receive. Paul called it the renewing of the mind uh, um, that you get through counsel. So I don't think it's deliverance or counseling. Christians who think deliverance is dirty, is nasty, um, unnecessary, that the cross handle all your devils, you no longer need to do anything but take communion. Um, th they just think you need a, a couple of good talking, you know, a couple of good uh, opportunities to express yourself, to have your journey uh, interpreted, to have your fears decoded, etc. Um, so they're going to gravitate towards that. And then those of us that are diehard um, deliverance people that don't believe in the power of, of training the mind and the emotions and the thought process, we're going to gravitate towards um, deliverance and, and act as if that once you are off the altar and once you know you picked up your demons and your cups and your paper towels, that you're done. But here's how it works in a pragmatic sense. Um, when you're dealing with uh, somebody, a, a believer in particular, that needs the ministry of deliverance, the area that you are working on is the soul. You're working on the soul, right? And what you're doing is you're actually evicting a demonic spirit, a demonic influence uh, out of the realm of the soul. the soul. Now, you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in the body. We learned last week in my teaching that demons can be housed in different facets of who you are, different areas in who you are. And so when you deal with the confrontation of uh, demonic powers in your soul, um, then what you have to realize is demons carry large levels of information. Okay. They are not unlearned creatures or unlearned people. Again, when I teach this subject, I have to over uh, um, uh, talk about uh, and, and overemphasize how our casual perusal of the scripture is behind much of our ignorance on this topic. But Jesus never introduced himself to a demon because they always had prior knowledge on who he was. They always had prior knowledge on who he was. Not only did do they have prior knowledge on who he was, the Bible actually says that they bow because they believe. So if demons bow because they believe, it must be based on a body of information and a body of knowledge that they didn't go to a class to get. Whatever they were doing before the human race got here, they had to have seen the Son of Man and his function and known who he was in righteousness 
so as to respond as aggressively as they did and as they do when he has walked up on them. So this is something you need to know. Demons are not stupid beings that sit up and blow bubbles and wait to be seen and play trick or treat with you people. And they don't get joy just off of making scenes in the middle of a church concert. They are highly informed beings. And the basis of their attachment to a soul and their attachment to a life is the information that they have. I said last week in my teaching, demons are legalists. You understand that? So... Um, when you are dealing with deliverance and, and you're dealing with the evicting, uh, of a demonic spirit from a life, from a family, um, then you, you've dealt with the presence, you have dealt with the, uh, the housing and you've dealt with the, the, the actual, uh, residence of a demonic spirit, right? But here's what you haven't dealt with. What you haven't dealt with is the information, the trainings, and the codes that a demonic spirit has left in your life after having been there for however many years they've been there. It, it, it's, it's like evicting a squatter from your house and not going in to repaint or to change the locks. So the problem with many of us that are in deliverance is that we don't have an equal skill set in counseling. And when you are a deliverance worker, to be effective, you probably should also have some degree of skill when it comes to training the mind, training the heart, training the emotions, training the pain tolerance because devils when they are in your life they're going to leave certain lessons pay attention and these informate these this body of information again i made this this aware of uh, to you last week if demons mock and mimic the holy spirit and the bible says the holy spirit is a teacher then it means that a demonic spirit is not silent in your life they are just unconfronted but they have left and they do leave certain beliefs certain um, perspectives certain informations in your life that are going to be the basis for their return entry. You believing as you do, you seeing life as you do, you seeing relationships as you do, are going to be the door that a demonic spirit looks for for re-entry once they've been removed. Because every deliverance is scheduled for a rematch. That's going to probably be at the latter part of this teaching. Many people get really relaxed after their deliverance and don't know how to prepare for the rematch. But the Bible says they always come back looking for an opportunity. And a part of what keeps them away from the life they left is not just the fact that the, the host, the life, doesn't want the devil there. It's that the host has now been trained on what to believe, how to think, how, how to deal with pain mechanisms and pain tolerance levels, how not to welcome a demonic spirit in your life by allowing your heart uh, to become sculpted by the principles of the word of God. Most of you have a heart that has not been vented. If you are paying attention, I want you to write this down. The heart needs to vent. Write that down down there. The heart needs to vent. Vent. V-E-N-T. Yes, the heart needs to vent. Part of what you need to know about deliverance is that it will deal with the spirit, the force, the being responsible for disseminating, responsible for releasing information, codes, beliefs, positions, whatever in your life, in your heart, in your soul. But a part of what it does not do is clean the heart. Deliverance deals with the demon. The word of God and the truth of God deals with the heart. You know what the problem is with a lot of people in deliverance cycles is that once demons leave, however they go, there is a raw heart there that has not been sculpted and not been trained because it needs to vent. 
It has been holding in events, traumas, views, perspectives, lies for years. And once the power of hell has been cast out, if there is no opportunity to share what has happened with the heart, what has been in the heart, the information, the views, all of that, then what's going to happen is when the rematch is scheduled, you're going to open your life again to the force that you are most comfortable with. Because for a season, when you have lived under the influence of demonic experiences, truth may not feel good. Truth may not feel easy. Truth may not feel like something that you want to embrace. You just probably don't want the, the, the counsel. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the presence and the harassment of a demonic spirit. So it's going to take you a while to be cultivated by truth. You know, I have a saying that says all the fish knows is water. And when you bring a person out of a dysfunctional way of life, then it's going to take them a while to have God's norm become their norm because they have been groomed, they have been taught, they have been catechized in a life of dysfunction to accommodate the presence of a demonic spirit. And depending upon the level of strength in that spirit, that thing had become so attached to your personality that you don't know the difference between you and the demon. So... Now there needs to be subsequent con conversations about what you believe and why, how you feel about relationships and why, what the thoughts, the, 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 the memorable thoughts and the marked views you t took along your way uh, in a painful process. Let me tell you this. Most Christians I know have no philosophy on how to deal with painful experiences. And this is one of the reasons why so many of us need deliverance. Nobody teaches us to deal with failure, to deal with loss, to deal with grief, to deal with pain. We pretty much in the church live in survival mode. And, and, and we have a, a tendency uh, to deal with crisis as it comes, we have no such construct to know what to do uh, 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 prior to it coming, um, how to prepare your life to, to rebound from it, how to not allow pain and painful experiences, be it with people or be it within ourselves, to not affect uh, the coming relationships or opportunities to relate that would come to our lives. And so uh, all of that cannot be handled by deliverance. That is handled by restoration. Deliverance binds, restricts, evicts the spirit. But counseling is what brings you restoration. It is possible to be delivered and not to be restored. What I mean by that is that the spirit can be cast out, but it doesn't mean that the, pl the place in your life that was occupied and crafted by the demonic spirit has now been rebuilt remolded and 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 I want to use the word redesigned to handle the tests the, the 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 drills that are going to come to you in the name of your destiny so yeah you have had a level of freedom in your life but you've not been reprogrammed to keep you out of the snare the mentalities the behaviors the bondages that actually was the welcome mat for the force to begin with so it is very possible deliverance and restoration is not synonymous as a matter of fact god cannot restore the one that refuses to be delivered so i believe that restoration is the aftermath and the byproduct of deliverance but you can't be restored without venting the heart allowing the heart to express what it's been through what it's seen the perspectives it's had how it felt the the fragile areas in it uh and then one of my biggest struggle in, in deliverance was catching your subconscious thought life. You know, I went through a very painful life. And um, when I started walking through levels of deliverance, being delivered was not the problem. It was being disciplined in that deliverance that was the problem because of my thought life and my thought world and my thought process and my thought pattern. So don't be so quick to exhale. <sighs> so glad that devil is gone. You now need to almost go to school by allowing somebody that is outside of your sto story, outside of your bondage, outside of your issue, hear the things that the heart need to vent, hear where you've been and where you've walked through to interpret 
what the entry point was for other bondages in your life and that beloved has to be done by counseling counseling is a function of the mint of the spirit of truth uh, because it helps to highlight the facets and features of your life that were under darkness and under bondage so i often say that uh, deliverance um, without discipleship is malpractice yes venting the heart is very much like counseling it gives you a point and a place of expression to allow someone other than yourself to show you how where you've been has affected you we have a tendency to behave as if we know everything that's wrong with our lives and we also have a tendency to think that we can always be self-diagnosed people you know I really believe that there needs to be a manifest marriage between deliverance and counseling somebody and, and you know what I think you need to be counseled at some point into the need for deliverance somebody needs to to go in and somebody needs to interpret and decode what may be active in your life and generally speaking particularly with us charismatic Pentecostal uh, uh, people or neo Pentecostals or those of us that come from holiness will embrace deliverance most of us at some point but don't tell nobody that they need counseling and don't imply that it should be a professional and 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 there's a such thing as pastoral counseling but I'm gonna just be transparent to say some of them shouldn't be counseling some of them can barely preach so they shouldn't uh, be trying to separate the thought and the thinking processes of your mind and your history and your journey to bring you into a level uh, uh, of clarity so I believe in counseling. I believe in professional counselors. I believe in Christian counselors, but I just believe they need to know what they're doing and they don't need to be experimenting on you or your children or your family or any of that stuff. And that's important for you to know. So I believe that there must be a marriage to make both as potent as they need to be. And, and I don't think deliverance needs to be so abrupt. I don't know that we need to just always take the approach of rushing up to somebody, grabbing their heads, kicking the devil out, letting it go, you know, walking around like a stray puppy and not going back to bring some wisdom, some perspective, some truth to what is going on in the heart. Because that is the place where the issues of life flow from. And if the heart is not trained on how it's going to handle disappointment, how it's going to handle loss, how it's going to handle shock, how it's going to handle grief, how it's going to handle, babe. if the heart is not trained, beloved, you will need deliverance forever. Why? Because you refuse to change the locks on the house that the devil once had. I've had a lot of things in my personal life uh, that I've walked through that required quiet deliverance. Um, and much of it started actually before I was born. But I'm going to tell you the hardest. Most recently in 2009, I walked through a three-year bout with the demon of grief. A three-year bout with the demon of grief. It was an abnormal grief. And the spirit of grief entered my life upon the murder of my father. I was graduating with my doctorate degree. And um, um, some of you have heard me share this, but the weekend of my graduation, uh, my father was supposed to be coming to Chicago to celebrate with my family and I. And um, it was a great accomplishment. Everybody was excited about it. And he was murdered. And, um, and my father had been in the Army all my life. It was a very decorated military vet and had never been shot, never broke a, bro broke a bone. And he came home on September the 4th and was murdered brutally at a barbecue. And um, so if that were not painful enough, I had a lot of very serious events s surrounding his death, betrayals from family members. Uh, uh, my brother had been estranged for us for 20 four or so years and um, he had just appeared uh, like two weeks before my father was murdered so his first time coming back around the picture uh, in our family um, uh, before he stayed with me his first time seeing my dad was actually in the casket after like 24 years that was September the 4th uh, of, of 2009, September the 4th of 2010, uh, my grandfather, who is Matthew Stevenson Sr., um, um, who was at my father's funeral, saw all of the, the junk that happened around it, and um, he actually um, was at home on the same day a year later, 
And when he looked at the calendar, looked at the clock and realized that it was September 4th, he chose to die. He literally laid back and gave up the ghost in death a year to date the same uh, day that my father died. So on the following year, after walking through two years of being attacked consistently by the spirit of heaviness, I would go around and hide in the month of September thinking that I was going to be next. I was Matthew, I am Matthew Stevenson the third. And so both Matthew Stevenson senior and junior died on September the, the 4th, <laughs> back to back. Now I was dealing with my own resentments, my own bitterness issues, my own anger, uh, my own sadness for my siblings and my own stuff. At that time I was the closest to my dad. Um, I was dealing with my own stuff. But something entered my life through the mix of anger and through the midst of the sadness of that, that I later found out was the spirit of grief. Because no matter what I did, where I went, no matter wh where I tried to go, how much I tried to vacate, no matter, it would not leave my life at all. I would be in church randomly and I would break down into an, an, an abnormal mourning. Now, when you experience the death of a loved one, you go into mourning. Um, but in the Bible, there were always appointed times to mourn and appointed times for mourning. When that goes over into years, it is demonic. It is demonic. So it was not until I received the ministry of deliverance and start realizing my need for counsel where I could actually vent how I felt, what I thought, and, and have some of those perspectives steered in the direction of truth that I started to make progress in my soul. So it was a, it was a painful thing. Grief is something I know very, very well. And it was the strongest demonic assault I had had in my adult life. And I am a man who is very acquainted with painful experiences, very acquainted with betrayal, very acquainted with, I mean, you name it. Uh, but grief was probably the worst thing that hit my life as an adult. And it hit me for three years. It was horrible. I felt like I was outside of myself watching my life on a TV. And it was not until I experienced the healing power of both deliverance and counsel that I started to make progress. Because now I had a, 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 a train of thought to 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 deal with the language the conversations and the fears and the stuff that I had taught myself during that grief period that I later on was demonic and so Paul talked about being renewed in the spirit of your mind be renewed in the spirit of your mind those are the thoughts you think that you don't know that you're thinking the thoughts that you think that you are not aware that you're thinking them and those beloved need to be confronted with the truth of the word of God before the Lord can build up the broken down places in your life in your story in your heart and where you've been so if you are in a deliverance process and you are walking through deliverance from anything whether it's addiction or whether it's unforgiveness or whether it's bitterness or whether it's depression whether it's anxiety whether it's it's the spirit of fear or, or phobos as, as the biblical word for it, or whether it's lust and sexual sin. If you are walking through a deliverance process and that, that is amazing. But you must also get follow up. You need to receive the ministry of counsel, the ministry of counselors. The Bible says it's by a multitude of counsel that a man maketh his war. The Bible also says that in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So you've got to have people in your life, professionals, experienced, whatever, that know the art of counsel and the art of asking you the right questions to take your heart and your mind on a journey into the direction of the Lord to keep you delivered from the thing that's been evicted from your life. So whether that's a mentor, a discipler, a therapist, a psychiatrist, um, whether it's a spiritual parent, whatever, you need counsel. So this guy, the man 2500 that's cursing on my periscope, he's the perfect example 
of somebody who needs counseling. You know, when you've been labeled as things as a child and you spend your time in forests and, and wood preserves, killing uh, in animals with shotguns because your father is a gross alcoholic, then you grow up later with those same resentments and those same angers. And what you do is you start retaliating at life. You start retaliating at your life's resentments. So without the ministry of deliverance from stuff like rage and from unforgiveness, you end up doing really weird things like coming on periscopes at random moments, actually picking up a phone to text derogatory or confusing or distracting messages to people who could care less. So it's, it's, it's a case in point. The Lord is faithful. Whenever I'm teaching my periscope audience something, some person always comes up and manifests the devil I'm talking about. Case in point right there. So I'm concerned about how many people of God are broken, are battered, are badgered down because they have not received the ministry of deliverance and they have not received the ministry of counsel. You need both in your life. I know people who have had the spirit of grief come in their life and I feel prophetically like maybe a lot of you are dealing with this. That's why I keep going to it. But I feel prophetically that a lot of you, I have known people who have gone into uh, grief and they have abnormal weight gain and it's not a funny issue it's not even just a dietary issue I have known people who say they are an emotional eater and what they're really saying is they are bound with the spirit of heaviness bound with the spirit of grief there is no thing or no such thing as an emotional eater if you ask me why it's because sadness don't have an appetite Happiness don't have an appetite. Excitement don't have an appetite. What you're saying is you're trying to feed something that has no stomach. You're really confessing that your pain has no way of expressing itself. So it's the devil's way of making you self-destruct. It's the devil's way of decaying your body and to put you in a place where you're so guilty and you hate your image and you hate your look, where it keeps you in a continual cycle of self-sabotage and self-destruction. So no, you're not an emotional eater. You deal with the spirit of oppression, a spirit of depression. That's what the Bible tells. I have known people to pick up hundreds of pounds because they could not confront sadness. They could not confront loss. They could not confront grief. They could not confront or overcome the feelings of abandonment. So deliverance is real. Demons are not playing. Now you don't have to believe in them for them to affect your life and you don't have to cross your fingers and hope that they don't enter your life. So do they, so do, they do. If there was a weak point, an unguarded area, an un garrison area in your life, you're probably going to be on the target of a demonic squadron that's going to be relentless at pursuing your life until they have occupied a space in your soul so as to make sure you cannot fulfill your destiny. So you need to know that. I'm praying for you that counselors come into your life. Find an elder at your church. Make an appointment with a pastor. Go and find a Christian psychiatrist, a Christian therapist. Do something, but you've got to vent your heart and let somebody else know where you have been. I'm going to leave you with this, and I say this very often. I believe there should be somebody in your life that knows at least 90% of your story. Somebody other than you should know at least 90% of your story. If you are the only one who knows at least 90% of your story, hear the word of the Lord, you are carrying too much. Your life was not designed to hold up that level of experience and those levels of exposure and those levels of hurt and pain and all of that and just until it just goes into your personality and you become so bitter uh, retali retaliating at your childhood resentments and to, or, or keeping people out saying that you're just guarded and you're protected. Somebody other than you needs to know at least 90% of your story. And if that is not the case, then what you're going to notice is it's going to manifest. I want you to hear me. If you don't find a people, a place, a safe spot to do that, then it will manifest in your life as infirmity. It's going to, I, I believe with every fiber of my being, I, my background, my academic background is in education, so I'm not a therapist. 
But let me say what I believe as a pastor, as a spiritual leader. I believe with every fiber of my being that the reason cancer is how it is is because people are emotionally sick. I believe that this outbreak of growths and tumors and chemical deficiencies and hormonal deficiencies and cellular molecular rebellion, I believe with every ounce of my being that it's not just food. I believe it's that people have been under decades of emotional decay and don't know what to do, carrying life and hurt and pain all in their body until it just manifests in other ways. So I'm praying for you. I want to see the people of God whole, out of bondage, out of sin cycles, out of abusive relationships, out of dysfunctional, irresponsible sex. Do you know what hurt me yesterday? I was preaching about a totally unrelated issue and at the lock-in last night. And I began to minister prophetically to some people. And I stood in front of a, 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 a older gentleman. And the word of the Lord came to me concerning a sexual relationship he was in with a pastor. As I prayed into it, I had a vision of who the pastor was. I called the pastor out by name. The gentleman fell on the floor. I got on the floor with him. I began to minister deliverance to him. Didn't know this gentleman. He was not a member of my church. He was a visitor. I went to the stage, look on my periscope to see it. I shut the music down. I got the microphone and I said, if you are here and you have been sexually handled, sexually raped, sexually molested by a pastor or your pastor, run to the stage. Do you know we had 28 people come to that stage? Men and women of various ages at that stage. I was expecting in my natural mind, maybe one or two. It was almost 30 people that had been sexually brutalized by pastors. And most of them were men that had their manhood taken away by some coddled up vampire walking around the cities looking for another altar boy to sodomize. It was horrible. I had to pray for these men and labor with them and I brought a team up there to, and I took my time to minister with them, but imagine what they would need after deliverance. What would they need? The ministry of counsel, the ministry of counsel. It's very real, it's very real. The ministry of counsel, a place for the heart to vent to release those experiences to somebody that they trust in a safe environment where they can't be judged, they can't be stigmatized and deal with. I just ministered to that one God because of what the Lord showed me prophetically. And then the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, deal with this now, there are more in the room. I had no clue, I'm like, this is a shut in. What you mean, folks are sleeping with pastors in here. I, I got that microphone and I had no clue it was that many people in there, but it's a very real issue in the body of Christ and they need deliverance. They need counsel. So this is my prayer. We need physicians of the soul, people who can mend the broken and put things back together and begin to attach men's lives where they've been shattered by the powers of hell. Finally, my brother, if you are out there and you feel a call to this, it is my recommendation that you pursue it in the fear of the Lord. God wants to use you to put men's lives back together. You need to begin to pursue this with the anointing, with experience and revelation, but you also need to pursue it professionally. Start to research it. Start to uh, 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 get skills in it to make you good at what you're going to do. If you don't intend to master it, don't say God called you to it because God has not called you to anything. He has not intended for you to master. And a part of mastering it is learning it by experience, learning it professionally, and learning it by theory and knowing it by revelation. If you don't know a thing by revelation, you don't know it at all. So you need to become invested and immersed in the world of the thing the Lord has called you to. Hey, beloved, I've got to go. I've got some notes to finish making. I bid you peace in the precious name of Jesus. Join me tomorrow at All Nations, 7359 South Chappelle in Chicago at 8.30 and 11.30. It's going to be amazing. I'm doing Let Us Alone. I'm continuing the teaching on deliverance and spiritual warfare, and I want to see you tomorrow. Hey, I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.